Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So welcome to those joining me this 26th of March 2023. I will be talking O'Day Centred. So how is everybody this beautiful Sunday spring day if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and I guess coming into the autumn if you're in the Antipodes? Hi Artifact, hi Reanderful, hi Cosmic Dave, Brad42948, Creating Awareness, Corky Goss D2105K, hi Rob DIY Projects with Chalksis, Martin Kemp, hi Stuart N, Kathy B, Crypto Alchemist, great to have you all here, hi James Vickers and Scotty, it's really wonderful, and the Ret Oracle, thank you, hi so, uh, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a short one. Maybe I'll do a live chat afterwards. Uh, however, what happened was on Friday afternoon, uh, about four o'clock, I came across a document and I was just running through the PDF, having downloaded it from uh, Academia. And uh, I just happened to ch chance on this diagram and I thought, hmm, that looks familiar. So uh, what document are we talking about? Well, it's the document that gave rise to this drawing here, and I will get it for you. Uh, it is called the Complete Pyramid Sourcebook, and if you go to remoteview.icu, I've given a link so that you can download and look at it with me today. And uh, it has this very, I would say, 1990s, uh, cover book here and it's by John DeSalvo PhD and it's got a press preface by Christopher Dunn and forward by Dr. Patrick Flanagan and an afterward by Paul Horn and uh, we have our uh, do, um, I have uh, Ra or Horus or whatever it is here and uh, it's called the Complete Pyramid Source Book. Okay, there you go, by John DeSalvo, PhD, Director, Great Pyramid of Giza Research Association. Okay, so there we go. Uh, it's got a large index, uh, and it's, uh, I guess, uh, 497 pages. Uh, you, I think you can actually get this in print, and so maybe people should go ahead and go get it. I don't know. Can't, uh, I didn't even look to see when it was uh, originally published. I guess it's on Amazon. Um, but it's got a whole lot of things there. But, uh, you know, even some things about Russian work and some things about uh, uh, Christopher Dunn and Robert Baval. These may be familiar to people who are uh, long-term aficionados of uh, pyramid research. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I've heard Christopher Dunn mentioned before. And I saw a couple of things in here that... Uh, um, some people have been talking about since I started talking about the pyramid. Um, but I, as I've said to you before, I like to clean room things. So I like to start from the science and then see if, you know, uh, there's any uh, physical manifestations of the application of the science, uh, either currently or backwards in time or unexplained things. And then look to see if anyone's done research in a similar area. Uh, that way I'm not being led by views uh, that previously existed. I'm, I'm coming from what you can actually see on the experiment. So, yeah, I was just skipping through this as I do, and I thought, uh, okay, there's a picture of a pyramid. Yep, uh, I was lucky enough to see that. That's copyright Christopher Dunn. And here's another picture of the pyramid. So I was skipping through that, and I thought, what's this? Uh, that's some stones and some casing stones. There's another shot of the casing stones. Uh, and I thought, oh, oh here is, here's a diagram I kind of recognize. It's a little bit lo-fi, but anyway. And skip through this, and there's all kinds of pictures of descending passageways and, and the step and stuff. This is what I call the, the Christ Center here. Um, and then you've got the sarcophagus here. And they're just skipping through, skipping through, skipping through. Uh, and these diagrams here of, I think, uh, the uh, lower... Uh, subterranean level and actually I, I you can see maybe in this image although there are uh, other images that are much higher quality of this that these early images of the subterranean chamber just show it's just complete heap of rubbish 
and and rubble and it, you know this would give the impression that it's an unfinished chamber in that like they're starting chipping away at it, it, it and they said well, i can't be bothered and just gave up it could be that actually this is disrupted the result of disrupted material uh, that is one argument uh, hypothesis that i have and that's just the the bits that you know ended up um after you've disrupted the material and apparently uh, I, I i was actually interested in this and i read a couple of pages and it said that like some colonel uh, vice uh, he he the pit was measured to be 12 foot deep colonel vice searching for hidden chambers had it dug deeper so the original pit was 12 feet deep it might have been full with rubble but this guy colonel vice I don't know. There's a lot of people out there that know a lot more about this than I do. But anyway, so I skipped on and I saw this little thing which uh, looked at and found these metal um, tags in one of the uh, shafts. And I carried on. I'm just looking for visual things, really. So I'm, I'm not overly interested in other th stuff because I want to be able to see if there's, you know, things out there. Oh, oh, oh this is interesting. These are some... Uh, I think Ukrainian scientists or Russian scientists that did various, uh, you know, explorations with pyramids. And they, in fact, uh, I think one of the authors here, I actually know he's still alive. But uh, um, anyway, they, they, they put these things even over um, uh, oil fields, uh, gas fields. And, and they also found that in one case... I just thought it's one of these cases they they had like extinct flowers suddenly reemerge out of the ground uh, that so the story goes but anyway so I I thought okay that's fine I'm that's not really what I'm meant to be looking at this document for so I carried on down I, I'm I'm looking for uh, research and so on and I came to this and I thought Joe Parr okay so this guy apparently has been on the summit of the Great Pyramid and I saw on the next page this. And I was a little bit taken aback. It says energy field or bubble around pyramid. And when I looked at it, I thought, wow, my, this does look a little bit like something that you would get that would be like the skin, the, this sort of weird skin of ball lightning that we've been talking about so much. And that plays a role, in, in my view, in uh, a lot of anomalous energy processes potentially all of them, and uh, obviously is component in Lena, if you consider the work of Matsumoto and the work of uh, John Hutchison and our work in many different experiments where we've seen these spherical areas removed uh, from uh, the inside of uh, reaction matrix. But it was this image on the right here that struck me. Now, obviously, from looking at this picture here, uh, I could tell that the guy was interested in being uh, associated with and doing research for the pyramid. He's standing on top of the pyramid. Not everyone does that. Therefore, he's obvious. And we, we, we'll read through this section. Um, so all I needed to see was this picture of him on the top of the pyramid. And I saw this. And this just immediately sent me off on... Um, you know, uh, what? why is he interested? Why did he see this bubble? What does it mean? And then when I looked at this, I thought, 52 degrees. It kind of sounds like the slope of the pyramid. And then he's saying the center of the bubble is centered around this point. And this is a crossing line between two lines that are at 26 degrees. And I thought, I don't know whether it is. But 26 degrees, you know, having looked at the the pyramids internals for a few weeks now, uh, it really did look like it was kind of the si so sort of angle of the ascending passageway. Now, uh, I thought, OK, I need to get a much better uh, 2D and then 3D uh, um, geometry for the inside of the pyramid. So I went to Wikipedia. Uh, and if I go there now, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so and, and I'm I'm not talking about um, uh, this, which uh, someone might get <laughs> uh, very very excited about. Uh, 
<laughs> this particular image. I'm not talking about this in, uh, particular image where apparently a rainbow uh, is... Um, sorry, the, the angles of the pyramid are exactly what you need to uh, be able to perceive a rainbow. Yes, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Wikipedia's uh, Great Pyramid entry. Ah, da, 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 da. Mm, give me a second. Because that's kind of where I got the the diagram I've been using, or at least I think that's where I got the diagram that I was using. And so I was going through the uh, Wikipedia entry here, uh, trying to find the diagram that I'd previously used. And I went down and I went down and I went down and I went down and I went down. And there's the diagram. I thought, oh, it's changed color. So I sort of clicked on it and I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. They kind of like added this uh, column in on the right here, uh, this, this corridor here. Okay. All right. Oh, hold on. This looks a little bit different. They've got a little different representation of this. They've got these dig zones here uh, in various places where where digs were done. Um, this looks like a little... Oh, hold on. The subterranean level actually has some of the uh, Petri kind of sketches going on in there. And it's actually got this it, it lower down correctly. And the antechamber... It looks like they've updated the image. Now, could they have updated the image because they've inserted this? Okay, so I, I went into the document here and it says, well, no, this is done, created uh, 18th of May 2015. And I said, well, that can't be the true because it's actually got this chamber here, unless there's a bit of a Mandela effect going on. There's, there's definitely this thing here, okay? Um, anyway, I, I wasn't dwelling on that too much. What I was interested in is that this file format is an SVG, which is Scalable Vector Graphics. And I know that I can pull that into uh, Adobe Illustrator and then I can export it as an Illustrator 3 file and then I can import that into my 3D software and then scale it knowing uh, a particular scale and we will see what we can see. Uh, okay, so I did that and let me get that for you. Um, So uh, here it is, and I've scaled it uh, correctly so that the height is as claimed for the height. And so we now have, in theory, a, a scalable uh, uh, vector in my 3D software that I can throw around and stuff. And so I thought, well, you know, what are the kind of angles we are talking about here uh, and you, I can do these uh, lines where I do an angle here and I go kind of like there, somewhere there, and I go along here, and then I go like that, and I go, okay, that's uh, that's not ideal. That's uh, 51.26. Well, it's, it's it, I'm being very rough with the lines that I'm suggesting there, but that's certainly close uh, to the 51.5, okay? And so I did a uh, search uh, on Google and you know a lot of people think well you know you should know these things but I don't and I asked you know what is the uh, slope of the Great Pyramid and uh, you can see I put it here and the Great Pyramid slope and it, and it comes up with on Google 51.5 degrees and I thought okay well the if I, I when I accurately measured the 3D diagram, sorry, the 2D SVG derived diagram from Wikipedia, it actually came out with a angle of 51.84. So I did a little bit more digging online, and it turns out the actual angle is 51 degrees, 50 minutes, and 40 seconds. And if you do the calculations, that ends up at 51.844444 degrees which is very close and uh, good enough for government work, um, 51.84 degrees there. So I did the same thing with finding out what the uh, angle of the uh, ascending passage was. 
And that turns out, if you look at the degrees, minutes and seconds, and you do the calculation, you end up with 26.041667. So I don't know whether this uh, uh, Google returned the, uh, um, angle is actually 51.5, as in 51.50 minutes. I don't know. But anyway, th this is what it is. And the, the, the diagram on uh, uh, Wikipedia actually is, is pretty accurate. And then we have this 26 degrees here. So that being said, if we go back to this diagram um, that is here um, uh, by this uh, chap, Joe Parr, that came out of his research, we have 52 degrees. Well, I'm saying that it is, uh, as I said, uh, where, should, where is it? 51.844444. Uh, it's not 51.5. I mean, you average 51.5. You know, you round it up, you get 52. And, but you're kind of not that accurate. But if you've got 51.844444, it's pretty, pretty accurate to say, uh, as it says here, 52. And 26, I think, is to the same number of decimal places, is pretty similar to this. So I thought, yeah, this is exactly what he's saying. Now, we'll come on, as I say, to the bubble in a little while. So what I wanted to do is, because this is an absolutely, unbelievably rubbish image in this document, it might be better in the printed version. It might be deliberately bad. In fact, all the images look really, really rubbish in this uh, uh, document you can download from Academia. It might be, it might be, that um, it's good in the actual printed version i can't say but anyway i needed to recreate this and so that's what i did so this is the joe part version here and it what i've done is i have uh, created our pyramid and what I've done, if I if I look at the angle here, I can go here, and I can go over here, and I can go up here, and you can see uh, maybe it's a bit small for you guys, but it is fifty one point eight four <laughs> degrees. Trust me, if you could see it, it is. Um, and if we if we do it again on here on this one, uh, it is twenty six point oh four degrees on this angle. So I actually went with the more accurate from the original plan. Uh, uh, sort of diagram here and I drew that into the center point here the center point here and then I drew a circle through the, from the center point there through the outside to create uh, the facsimile of the diagram that he has here okay now what I did is I overlaid that over my properly scaled uh, and this is properly scaled uh, pyramid and this is what I got so uh, you can look at it in inverse there okay and look at it in verse and sure enough yes the line here uh, is essentially parallel to this one uh, of the ascending passageway in the grand gallery um, but of course it's not incident with it okay and I thought well how do we get you know where would we get a situation where we took the and it, it's slightly different when you actually look at this some of the the angles here are slightly changed because th this comes up at this angle and then it bumps up there and it comes up here and then you got the jump up to what I call is the Christ center there so I thought what what do I have to do uh, to have something that that starts at the top here okay Starts at the top and goes in this pyramid 51 point or 50, 51.844444 uh, angle, slope angle, and that has this that then meets where this line is the line of the ascending passageway and the uh, grand gallery. Okay, now I ho hope you can see that, but uh, it's not perfect, uh, I know, because the lines aren't necessarily thick. So actually, because I have these tools available in the 3D software, I can literally 
draw from here to here and move it down. But to save you the, the hassle, I actually lined those up so that the the, the length of this 26 point, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, angle, what is, what is it? Let, let me just confirm that. It is uh, not there. It is 26.041667. Uh, that lines up um, with the whole thrust of this. And essentially, because there is some slight variation here, I have to line it up so that it, it meets the top of the gallery and it, it's always within the channel, the open channel there. Okay. All right. So I did that and this is what I ended up with. So I've, it shifts down and I'll turn that one off. And what it is, is you, you essentially what I've done is I've, I've taken the top point and it's kept to the top point of the original pyramid top on the apex there. And it comes down, it comes down, it comes down, it goes underground effectively. And then you draw the line back up from this underground construction line. And what it does is it hits the inside of the uh, ascending passageway right here absolutely spot on and then it goes up and it kind of like goes through the ascending passageway at an angle and it kind of hits the exact bottom here of the raised part in the grand gallery and then it and then it starts to come into a little bit into the grand gallery a little bit into the grand gallery a little bit into the grand gallery and you know where it ends up exactly <laughs> and precisely on the apex of the step at what I call the Christ center. Okay? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I, I could not imagine that that would be that perfect. Um, okay, so I'm relying on... I've accurately built this diagram from what was... Uh, uh, suggested uh, by Mr. Uh, Joe Part on the conclusion of his research. Okay, uh, I am not taking the pyramid as he drew it, although I don't know if there's any documents that say it should be extended below ground and this should line up with the ascending passageway and the grand gallery. Um, but if you do that, it, it just it just doesn't. It, it doesn't hit any of the marks, okay? It doesn't hit the ascending passageway and so on. So I'm just extending that down below the ground and we get this construction. And with that in place, we can then drop in the overall structure here. Now, um, I, I've done a lot of scaling because my structure wasn't quite right. <laughs> it wasn't quite right. Um, uh, and I need to remodel this. But uh, to cut a long story short, uh, this is the best I got to uh, up to this point. And I will remaster this uh, from scratch. But again, the Christ Center uh, hits the very top of uh, that uh, part there, which is exactly the same place that this guy's work also would, in my view, suggest the center is of the this uh, sphere that we're going to discuss what he found about that in his research which apparently was replicated by a third party and when you see what that is if you haven't already read it with the link that I gave earlier it is absolutely incredible the claims that he is making for it because it is the same understanding I have from studying physical Lena data okay all right, so um, we will start with our n minus one tour, and we will we'll, we will change this to uh, uh, textured here, so we can see what we are looking at here. So if I actually take out the pyramid for now, I'll take out the pyramid here, and I will take out the uh, th my structure here. You can see that. Uh, based on his construction lines, the two tours of the overall structure are exactly opposite, uh, either side of the center here. 
Uh, and if we go to the tour up from that, the main tour here. Now, with this new diagram from Wikipedia uh, and the scalable vector graphics converted into the geometry and everything scaled correctly with the geometry that I derived from physical experiments, this disruption zone here, if we actually bring in the pyramid now, it would appear that now the top of or part of the uh, the the subterranean level is exactly instant. Now we do know that it goes off to one side, and so in my view, uh, it is what it is. In my view, and you know, until I show see a better better understanding of what's going on, and and the physical damage marks change then I think this is what it is and I will actually probably in a up-and-coming presentation describe actually what I think this bottom is uh, in terms of the overall uh, forces involved the, the structure uh, of how they play out but uh, it makes logical sense but anyway um, so uh, th th this is essentially derived from the sphere on the tungsten affected by HHO in the form of a Mars gas with the shear forces and the ionizing state caused by the plasma caused by the burning HHO and and so on so that for me was a little bit uh, spooky uh, when that kind of lined up so you can see that there we go so and we do know that it's kind of off to one side okay so that that was that okay and um you know, you, you've, you've pretty much seen the rest of this. Um, where, where we go? We're going to go end tour there. Then we've got our mm, apple, well, our lemon. So uh, under this diagram, the if I take out the end tour, you can see that under this diagram, the uh, entire king's chamber, absolutely every single part of it, is in the lemon. And so is the... Uh, queen's chamber here so-called queen's chamber now under the end tour uh, we take that out in the end tour the entire queen's chamber is in the end tour it is only not not the um, granite facing stones it is only the uh, uh, so-called relieving uh, limestone um, blocks that are uh, spanning between the the uh, cone and the outside area okay so that is that um, and then we have our apple and as we know the apple kind of like encapsulates everything but as as said before the apple does not extend outside of the original boundary of any of the constructed part of the structure so uh, it's all in uh, this non-spin material and as we've shown before Lena tends to produce calcium and so and carbon and oxygen so calcium carbonate is not really a problem you're just going to get more of it if it kind of has other things to play with <laughs> so it, it, it's, it is the target that it's already made from, if you know what I mean. And in this case, when we turn on the sphere, and this sphere is the sphere that ate out the material from the Amasa vibrator plate, okay? And this, if we put on the sphere here, of course, it is dead centered. It is dead centered with the... Uh, overall disruption sphere uh, or this sphere that we're going to discuss um, that this other research scientist had found was created by a pyramid type structure under certain circumstances and then he talks about the properties that he identified for it so anyway so th this is what we've got here and of course it's equidistant the other thing that's interesting is that in in this case the amount of of the sphere that I have identified, which is disruption sphere, is almost equal 
uh, here and here to the bit that's underneath. It's a little bit less, but anyway, there we go. Um, that's just by the by. But uh, we have seen on experiments where there is this kind of field around the main structure and then there's this other uh, area a little bit further out which is partially effective. We've also seen, for instance, in the toroid uh, that was in the copper 15 millimeter uh, eaten out section, the toroid that was over to one side, it had a coherent matter layer where it was pure iron with a thickness and then there were these uh, like 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 it was a fuzzy ball there were these tendrils coming off that extended out a distance and then basically stopped they only went out a certain distance and I'm wondering if this is the event horizon but you've got like a, a, a kind of like boundary uh, of uh, you know disruption uh, going on uh, between the the event horizon and this little area out here um so you know that that is kind of like uh, some thoughts that i've had since seeing this okay so uh that is it uh for the overall structure uh just again uh the original pell uh structure here was there i looked at how that sat with the pyramid and i realized that that wasn't suitable uh, because it doesn't follow the grand gallery and the descending passage it might it might uh, um, connect with the upper passage and that's something to consider uh, at some point when that is better defined but if that's the case and we had a similar descending passage here you know would it line up with that I don't know okay so um, that that's as that is so I elected to uh, shift that down so uh, it, it, it is the line of this identified line is entirely in the open volume of the uh, ascending passageway and the grand gallery and to do that it required having it exactly placed on the Christ center as we had uh, the Cairo center at the top step of um, the ascending passageway grand gallery sort of vector okay and that then lined up with our uh, n minus one tools and so forth uh, and our lemon and our thing and our sphere okay so with that said we're going to look and i'm just going to read through and uh, pull out some points from this passage in this book because I think it, you know it was a little bit weird for me to be reading it on uh, Friday afternoon and I was going to do a breakdown of the anomalies in the GEET reactor and how they are logically consistent uh, with this structure and what we've observed in other systems but given the fact that you know this came to the table uh, on Friday, I kind of like went with what the universe was telling me to do. So um, that's what I did. <laughs> so let's go and read uh, what is said here about uh, Mr. Um, Mr. What's his name? Mr. Joe Parr. Now I'm just going to, I'm going to see if there's anything else earlier than this. We are on page for those that want to follow along 170, 170. I'm going to see if there's anything earlier in the document for, for us to look at with regard to par um, previous. That's 130. Joe Parr, whose research will be discussed later. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, par looks to be discussed. This is how little I've read this document. So, uh, <laughs> we'll have to bear with me. So, chapter 12, Pyramid Hyperspace Research. If another researcher came up to me and told me the findings that I am about to discuss, I would be very sceptical and my first question would be who did this research and what are their credentials? So for this reason I want to first tell you a little bit about Joe Parr. I first met Joe Parr several years ago. He has been an electronics engineer for over 40 years and currently is employed by a company that develops deep sea oceanography transducers in California. He is known as the inventor of the gamma ray transducer, 
which is a device for measuring radioactivity levels around alternate energy sources. He was also involved in eight government projects spanning the globe, including the Arctic and Antarctic, where he wintered at both locations. He is still not allowed to dis discuss some of his work from that time, but he did tell me that when he wintered at the, Antar at the Arctic, a B-52 bomber circled overhead 24 hours a day. So this is a man with excellent credentials and an extensive research background. In addition, when Joe was in the business world, he went through law school and holds a law degree. Joe Parr is also one of the few people who have spent an entire night on two separate occasions, 1977 and 1987, on top of the Great Pyramid of Giza, conducting electrical, magnetic and radioactive measurements. So, this is a picture of him. This is Joe Parr. Thank you, Joe Parr, for your contribution here. Copyright Joe Parr. Thank you, Joe Parr. Joe Parr. So, an interesting story is that in the 1960s, Joe hired Dr. David Vimiatmani to work on his, in his company to help set up a research facility in Las Vegas. Previously, Dr. Vimani uh, developed a and installed a totally secret communication system for Juan Perón, the dictator of Argentina. Its purpose was for Perón to keep in, in contact with his military generals without being overheard. This new type of polyphasic communication, which he developed, was so successful that Perón distrusted anybody that knew about it, and he ordered his own men to take Vermetmani out to the desert and eliminate him. Oh, nice. <laughs> Fortunately, he escaped and continued his research with Joe, developing polyphasic communication systems and experiments in bouncing signals off the moon. This led Joe to pyramid research. Okay, bouncing signals off the moon and working with a polyphasic communication system that you couldn't intercept. I wonder what that could be. And that led him to Pyramid research. Okay, yep, that, there's some connection there that we might know we've got, but maybe we don't. Joe has now done pyramid research for over 30 years and is currently the coordinator of experimental projects for the Great Pyramid of Giza Research Association. Let us look at the experiments Joe has been doing with pyramids in his lab. Joe Parr, like early pyramid researchers, had discovered that strange physical phenomena happen inside any object in the shape of a pyramid. Other shapes, such as cubes, octagons and spheres, do not experience the same phenomena. The pyramid shape has the potential to trap theoretical particles known as mass particles. Mass particles exhibit some properties of matter, such as inertia, but are not subject to quantum laws. When a pyramid traps mass particles, a bubble forms around the pyramid. This bubble is some kind of energy field that forms a shield to protect the mass particles. The reason why the pyramid captures mass particles is unknown, but we can measure this field and verify its existence. And this is the diagram that I've just broken down for you and how it relates to the Pyramid of Giza, the Great Pyramid of Giza, according to my opinion. Then it gives a photograph of a possible mass particle taken inside the Great Pyramid. Here we go, something. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. It looks a little bit like a torus. Maybe? Don't know. Something's in the way, is it? Mm, I think so. Photo by R. McCollum inside the Queen's Chamber. Joe can experimentally cause a model pyramid to capture mass particles by rotating a pyramid in an alternating magnetic field. This is done by using a high-speed centrifuge with a pyramid mounted at the end of one of its arms while spinning at very high speeds, 950 to 1800 RPM revolutions per minute, through a magnetic field. As the pyramid captures mass particles, an energy field or bubble forms around the rotating pyramid. Another really terrible diagram I have no idea what's what, I guess. The pyramid's on the end here, and this is the bubble that's forming around it. That's as much as I can get from that, because it's otherwise totally unreadable, right? And here is a picture which is slightly more readable, uh, and it's spinning around. Okay, 
Okay, here's where it gets really interesting for me. Maybe for you? I don't know, but it got interesting for me. It was found that as you increase the speed of rotation of the arm on which the pyramid is mounted, the inertia of these mass particles increase, and this in turn causes an increase in the energy of the bubble surrounding the pyramid. As the bubble's energy increases, it starts to have the property of shielding or blocking energy fields from passing through it. Thus, the more energy the bubble has, the greater its ability to shield the pyramid. If you continue increasing the speed of rotation of the centrifuge, a point will be reached where so much energy has been delivered to the bubble that it will be completely closed to all known energy fields. Joe has devised a series of experiments to measure how effective the bubble could block known energy fields like electromagnetic radiation, radioactivity, radio waves, and gravity. Basically, he placed energy sources that emitted various fields inside the pyramid and measured the amount of shielding or blocking of these sources by the bubble. For example, he placed a radioactive source which gave off gamma rays inside the pyramid and measured the attenuation of the gamma rays outside the pyramid. He also placed a radio frequency source inside the py and measured the blocking effect that the bubble had on it. Likewise, he did this with radioactive sources also. Also, he also measured the effect of gravity by measuring the weight loss of objects inside the pyramid using extremely sensitive scales. He has demonstrated with over thousand, with thousands of experimental runs that his bubble does indeed block off all known energy fields that we know of. Nothing can pass in or out of the bubble. Nothing can pass in or out of the bubble. Remember what I was saying. When you have this structure, this bubble, when it is energized and you know, he's arguing this bubble, I'm arguing at least this bubble. When it is energized, you can't get the water in down to this chamber and it can't get out, okay? And so it has to come up inside the bubble to go into this part of the reactor, okay? It has to have this so-called well to allow for the, in my view, the disassociated gases because the proton has spin but the the, the oxygen doesn't, but it can access and split the water because of the proton spins and the electron spins. And it comes up here and the oxygen goes in here and the hydrogen goes in here to be properly charged, separated. Okay. Nothing can pass in or out of the bubble. Not only does the bubble completely block all known forces, but also inside the bubble, objects become weightless. Boom! <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> okay. Gravity, which acted on the pyramid before, can no longer reach it. I would argue it's the thing that causes the effect of gravity. Can't reach it. And so then it can't express gravity. Now, it can't move in, in response to a so-called gravitational body. Can no longer reach it because of the shielding effect of the bubble. I agree. I agree. Joe has measured the weight loss of objects using an Ohio, uh, 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 O-House precision plus scale and another ultra-sensitive measuring device. The bubble or barrier will maintain its existence as long as it stays in the magnetic field. Hmm, I wonder what magnetic field... The Great Pyramid of Giza is inside. What, what, what magnetic field is it? Is the Great Pyramid of Giza inside? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's the Earth's geomagnetic field. Uh, <clears throat> right, diagram of the and section of the view. So here we got we got pyramid on the end here, and it's spinning around. Okay? And there's a bunch of magnets here. Now, we do know that if you spin these kind of things, um, you're going to be create firstly these are cones okay and when uh shishkin span cones they produce strange radiation strange radiations are clusters of cold neutrinos this is kind of spinning the cones around a different axis so you know it 
I, I would like to see an experiment where it's spinning around the axis like this, but it's the, the cone itself is spinning around an axis. The other thing is that Bogdanovich's work uh, from 2017 published in the Moscow uh, from the Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute showed that if you have gamma photons and x-ray photons hitting a magnet they also knock off monopoles these birdies these clusters off the faces of mag magnets where they accumulate okay so you know there's a lot of things going on here where these things can uh, you know be brought into play okay so other than that, I can't really tell you much about this <laughs> because it's unreadable. <laughs> okay. Now, at the very instant that bubble is 100% closed off, Joe believes that the pyramid no longer exists in our space-time continuum and the pyramid enters hyperspace. I don't know. I don't know. But what I can say is... It's something you can say. <laughs> okay. So, uh, like, he has a pyramid here, and there's a thing to spin it. And uh, I think that the pyramid almost looks like it's transparent, so you can, like, see inside it. Okay. It's a very serious piece of a kit here. He wasn't doing this for a joke, right? <laughs> okay. Again, you can see some of the apparatus that he used here. Okay. Thus, in hyperspace, the pyramid does not occupy the same physical space as before, but is now in another spatial dimension. To explain this briefly, we live in a three-dimensional spatial world. It has length, width, and height. You can define the location of every object by its x, y, z coordinates. Hyperspace would be a fourth spatial dimension. While not all scientists agree that the pyramid enters hyperspace, most admit that the results of Joe Parr's experiments cannot be explained by conventional physics. Thus, something unusual is going on. I can say that Dr. George Eagley does think or did think, uh, uh, certainly I've had good discussions with him, that ball lightning goes into hyperspace. This coherent matter layer that is on the boundary of ball lightning that gives it this glow uh, is effectively equivalent to what is being described by this author and by his experiments uh, by the scientist and therefore it is uh, uh, you you can you can see how uh, Joe Parr's experiments line up with the claims of uh, Dr. George Eagley okay it must be made clear that any pyramid can have this bubble or energy around it because of its shape and ability to trap mass particles okay in a resting I, I would argue the things that cause mass. <laughs> okay. Uh, in a resting pyramid, the energy field may not be very strong or measurable. So the purpose of Joe's experimental setup is to produce this bubble around a pyramid and increase its energy so it closes off to all known fields. Joe has measured this energy field in his lab using model pyramids for over 25 years and has made another astonishing observation. The pyramid's energy field, or bubble, is ultra-sensitive to the sun's 11-year sunspot cycle. It appears that this field is strengthened by neutrino particles given off by the sun, which vary with the 11-year cycle. Now, I have argued that normal neutrinos from nuclear reactions that are emitted are not the type of neutrinos that are really in play here but that during different sunspot activities the cold neutrinos because of the way the sunspot has these magnetic flux loops and and they break down and so forth can allow for relic neutrino type energy uh, neutrinos to come out which ordinarily would not escape the sun's gravity because they don't they don't have enough kinetic energy that due to sunspot cycles, you can have a variation in the flux from the sun of relic neutrinos, according to Alexander Parkhamov, the type that interact and do these nuclear reactions. And it is these ones that are raining down on the Earth from all angles, these micro corpuscles, according to Tesla, that uh, result in what I call, uh, um, or I equate to the push... Um, uh, theory of gravity and their interaction with ordinary matter. So this statement is consistent with my understanding 
that during different phases of the sun, sun's sunspot cycle, you will have a varying effect of Lenner experiments, okay? It appears that this field is strengthened by neutrino particles given off by the sun, which vary with the 11th cycle. I would say with the flux of cold neutrino or relic neutrino type uh, kinetic energy particles given off by the sun. Now, uh, if you have a thousand degrees, you start to produce of any dense matter or plasma, you start to produce relic neutrinos. If you get up to the temperatures of tungsten, you can have like 25 to 50 percent uh, of uh, the matter doing that and the surface of the sun is in that kind of order of uh, uh, you know tungsten type temp temperatures like melting point of tungsten and so on so um you would have a large amount of the material uh, of the sun's surface able to produce these cold neutrino type energy structures which are non-nuclear they're produced by uh, uh, kinetic collisions of uh, matter uh, and those uh, um, structures are ordinarily unable to escape from the sun, but they do init help initiate and, 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 and play a role in the sun's nuclear burning process. But during the sunspot cycle, I've argued in the past, and Joe is finding an experiment that varies with the sunspot cycle, which I would argue is due to these particles which are the cause of uh, gravity um, uh, it's all entirely consistent with everything we've been saying for at least half a decade now an interesting thing happens at certain times of the year at these times not only does the bubble close off to all known energy forces and object and objects inside become weightless but the pyramid tears itself off the machine arm and becomes propelled in space it sometimes self-destructs or flies off into a wall. Joe has done over 55 experiments which seem to indicate that at times this pyramid does pass through physical objects. Joe has done over 55 experiments which seem to indicate that at times this pyramid does pass through physical objects confirming Joe's theory that it enters hyperspace at that moment. Do you understand what I've just read there? Ball lightning appears to be able to go through ordinary matter, sometimes without interacting with it. Okay? Ken Shoulders says that you can teleport matter. Shishkin has observed the effective teleportation of atoms from inside something through other materials. In the book that I read from uh, Vasilatos recounting Tesla's work, he showed that something was able to pass through dielectrics and through metals and still explode in his body, giving him a sting. Okay? And these are things that are packaged in, I believe, this shielding that uh, allows it to have no charge or express no charge and no mass. Exactly as Ken Shoulders said, this, my friends, is teleportation capability. If you can package something, and he is arguing, in this here, the pyramid does pass through physical objects. The pyra This pyramid does pass through physical objects. This isn't atoms, my friends. This is a physical object passing through other physical objects. And the only way that can do that is if there is no charge because that is the only force that's going to stop it from passing through okay this would explain why you have a metal coin or a piece of wood or a metal knife passing into another piece of metal in the john hutchison effects john hutchison effects clearly using monopoles these structures which are clearly the same as ball lightning packaging your structure in something that it then allows it to pass through other material. This is teleportation. The time of the year that these strange events happen is from December the 13th to 16th. That's very precise. After 13 years of continuous recorded data, Joe thinks he has discovered why. At that time, the Earth passes between the Sun and the constellation Orion. 
Joe has discovered a continuous energy conduit or stream between the Sun and Orion. This conduit is composed of neutrino particles coming from the Sun and moving in the direction of the constellation Orion. It is important to realize that we do not know if they are uh, actually going to Orion, but this is the direction of the particle's conduit, particle conduit. In addition, if you continue this line back through the Sun and onward in the opposite direction, then you will arrive at the center of our galaxy. Astronomers in 1979 discovered an X-ray emitter source at the center of our galaxy. No one knows what it is or why it is there. Joe's energy bubble is dependent on this X-ray emitter source. I've told you, X-rays are able to knock these structures off uh, the poles of magnets, according to the findings of the Moscow Nuclear Physics Research uh, um, uh, uh, with Bogdanovich et al. For example, when the X-ray emitter stops, as it does at times, the energy bubble around the pyramid disappears. This X-ray emitter source, called the Great Annihilator, was discovered by astronomers in 1979 and is another variable in the pyramid experiments of Joe Parr. Right, now, here you have the Sun and the Earth and the constellation Orion. Okay, Sun and Earth and constellation Orion. My friends, I don't think this is coming from the sun other than when you are in those phases of the sun's 11-year sunspot cycle when there is a higher flux coming from the sun. I think this is gravitational lensing of relic neutrino fluxes from the center of the, the galaxy out to the constellation Orion as proven in Space Earth Human by Dr. Alexander Parkamon. Boom! Done! Same, same data, different interpretation. Okay? So, the thing is about the constellation Orion, if we actually look at that, I think, I think this is mentioned later on. Uh, I think if I, if I search this guy's name, we can see there's another bit of data somewhere later. And we'll come back to that. Uh, this was a guy replicating the work, I think. Uh, la, 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 la. Okay, that's the shielding. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay, right. Has he got it? Okay, so. This is the constellation of Orion. What do we have in here? We have Betelgeuse. There we go. Constellation Orion, we have Betelgeuse, okay? Betelgeuse is not small. Betelgeuse, my friends, is 764 times as large as our sun. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> Let me get that right. Right, right. Uh, I think it's the radius is... Uh, 764 times as large as the sun. Uh, what is Regal? Regal is behind uh, Beta Betelgeuse, okay? Uh, all right, it's in the same constellation. Let's let's just go to a Wikipedia or let's do a, a quick Google search. Uh, I will do Regal compared to Sol. Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> okay. It's quite luminous. <laughs> uh, regal size. I should want size. So, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so Regal is 70 times uh, the diameter of Sun, and it's uh, 21 times more massive. And uh, if I can spell it right, Betelgeuse compared to the size, it's 75, 764 times larger uh, than the sun. And why I'm focusing on that is because Alexander Parkamov actually can detect when his telescope was pointing in the direction of Betelgeuse and things were lined up. Because it 
is a very large gravitational attractor for fluxes of relic neutrinos. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> so, what has been shown by PAR? If we go back to that, effectively, in my view, is that when he has the most extreme effects, it, it is when the sun is here, the earth is here, and Betelgeuse and Regal, Betelgeuse and Regal, over these days, this specific days, uh, where is it? Where, where, blah, 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 blah. Between December the 13th and 16th, I imagine that you're in this sweet spot between Betelgeuse and Regal uh, and the sun, and you have a huge, great gravitational lens from the center of the universe. Do you understand the significance of this? This is showing a flux of relic neutrinos. Now, what happens according to Shishkin et al. and Dubovic in their research, when you properly, properly ionize material, in the case of Tesla, it was beryllium, magnesium, or aluminium. In the case of what we're talking about in HHO, which a lot of Lenner experiments are HHO, when you properly ionize hydrogen, which is 2,000 to 4,000 times easier, according to Krolls, to properly ionize, what they are claiming is that you automatically get a condensed cluster of relic neutrinos released from that process. So rather than relying on the alignment of the center of the galaxy, Earth, Regal, and Betelgeuse, you are creating the environment for abundant flux of relic neutrinos condensed into the solitons, which they call, this is, Shishkin and Dubovic. Dubovic is the guy that came up with a fractal toroidal moment. Okay? They are saying that that is magneto-toro electrical radiation. Or strange radiation in the neutral form. And that for some reason in the pyramid, this is able to aggregate. If it is in a magnetic field. Note. I've shown you in the Lion in the Desert presentation, which I shared many moons ago, the video that I took in Hungary, that a pyramid will create an electric field, an electric potential between the top and the bottom. So you have an electric potential, you have gravitational uh, orientation. I believe that it just works. It just does it. In the case of the Lion reactor, the solenoid provided the magnetic field. In the case of the Pyramid of Giza, the Great Pyramid of Giza, it was, in my view, the geomagnetic field that helps along with the fact that relic neutrinos and their clusters are partially reflected by dense matter. Dense matter includes, includes calcium carbonate. It includes the composite elements in uh, granite. They are also dense matter. Okay? So you have an environment where these things are created. They are able to cluster. And they are locked into place by the geomagnetic field of the Earth. And this work shows that when you do a pyramid and you spin it, it's most affected when, in my view, and I've argued before I read this, that... The sunspot cycle extreme it, it, it increases the rate of <clears throat> um, uh, how should we put this? Oh my god! I just realised something. <gasps> oh my god! Oh, <laughs> I've literally just realised something right now. In two thousand and twelve, when we had our first experiment that was successful. Testing, ha, I cannot believe this. I literally cannot believe this. When we were testing 
Wow. Wow. When we were testing the Chalani wire, we started the experiment. I said, I want to go for an auspicious day. So I chose the 12th of the 12th of the 12th. 12 minutes past, uh, 12 seconds past 12 minutes past 12. California time. California time. 2012. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. That was in Europe December the 13th, 2012. I literally cannot believe that. I gave my presentation in Rome at a military base on December the 14th, 2012. I literally cannot believe what I am understanding right now. This, this is utterly breathtaking to me. Because we struggled to get similar results at other times. You need to create the flux of relic neutrinos. Okay? It's not going to happen all the time. If you haven't got a system that produces them. Oh my God. God! <laughs> wow! Wow, wow, wow. I could not have expected that that would come out of giving this presentation tonight. That's just literally mind-blowing to me. Totally. we. I was presenting that. I was literally presenting that on December the 14th. Wow. It was an auspicious day. I, I said to I said to um, to uh, Ryan and and to Matthew, I said this isn't going to happen for a thousand years. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. It's gonna, not going to happen for a thousand years. We need to start this experiment at this time. Twelve seconds past twelve minutes past twelve on December the twelfth, two thousand and twelve. <laughs> okay that, that's that's really made my night that's made my month that's made my year okay i'll read on i'll read on uh so so basically the time when the mfmp had that successful experiment um was exactly exactly at the time that we were aligned with regal and beetlejuice and it later turns out that you can detect the flux that is lensed from, I guess, the center of the galaxy and the um, uh, Earth to the constellation of Orion <laughs> at that time. It's just absolutely mind-boggling. I'm a little bit weirded out right now. It's a little bit weirded out. This is one of those moments when you think you're actually just living in a matrix. <laughs> Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, <coughs> la 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 la. Okay. So there we go. This is this is this is this is just freaky. This is just freaky. December the thirteenth. I, I, I'll, I'll show you. I mean, look. I, I'll do it right now. Um, uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, Martin flies. Memorial Project. Interesting. My movie comes up at the top. <laughs> hmm. uh, and we want to search on here. Let's go here. And we will... Is that going to let me do that? Ah, what's going on there? Hold on. Let me try and do this. Um, mm. Okay, so there we go. I, I'm not making it up. Ten years ago. Look at look at the date there. Uh, it was. Uh, there we go. Fourteenth of the twelfth, twelfth. <laughs> That's when I gave this presentation in Rome. 
All right, there we go. I'm totally, totally freaked out about that. Uh, that uh, I'm totally freaked out about that. <laughs> okay. All right. So, wow. Okay. All right. Let's read out what else we've got. What else we got here? Dan Davison, a physicist from Arizona, has repeated much of Joe Parr's research and arrives at the same results. See Article H. We're going to have a look at Article H. His experiments also show that when the Earth passes through this conduit between the Sun and Orion, the pyramid rips off the centrifuge arm. It appears that the pyramid is trying to move down this energy conduit and propel itself in the direction of Orion. Joe has discovered that this bubble or energy field can also be uh, energized and turned off and on with sound. Sound. Joe has discovered that this bubble or energy field can also be energized and turned off and on with sound. That, I believe, is what is going on in an ultra experiment. It is very interesting that Joe Parr has recently discovered the frequency to be 51.5 cycles per second. And the slope of the Great Pyramid, which is almost exactly 51.5 degrees. I've discussed that. It's not really, but anyway. anyway. In degrees, minutes, seconds. It's very close. Thus, the slope of the Great Pyramid equals the resonant frequency of the field force coincidence. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm buying this part of the argument but i can agree that it would be turned on and off by sound why because sound causes iron acoustic waves because sound causes shearing forces because sound causes turbulence and when you have these structures in turbulence you get the formation of these vortex and anti-vortex pairs the vortex and anti-vortex pairs as you see in the free body of Suhas Raukar fluid and as you see in the free gas you see these structures the same structures forming this specific sound frequency intensifies the entire pyramid force field now the interesting thing is that in Henk Uren's experiment he is in Europe he is using 50 cycles per second in his pulsing from his uh, m uh, put together um, Cockcroft Walton device. So it has a DC bias, and then there's, say, 700 volts pulsed from the Cockcroft Walton, but it's there pulsing when it's at the cycle peak, okay, which is very close to 51.5 cycles. Could we have more success with our experiments by slightly changing the phase from 50 cycles a second to 51.5 cycles per second or something akin to the actual uh, uh, degrees, minutes, seconds of the slope of the pyramid? Would that improve our results? I don't know. This specific sound frequency intensifies the entire pyramid force field. Now, if we can turn this sound frequency on and off inside the Great Pyramid, the force field would also turn on and off. When the force field turns off, the energy in the force field collapses and allows a group of particles to travel through the pyramid and down the energy conduit. Dan believes this pulse travels towards Orion. In 1997, Joe Parr and Dan Davidson traveled to Giza to conduct experiments. Joe built a special signal generator with an attached audio amplifier. Their object was to gain access to the pit chamber of the Great Pyramid where they believed that the energy bubble just enters the room. Their object was to gain access to the pit, the subterranean chamber, chamber of the Great Pyramid where they believed the energy bubble just enters the room. Do you understand what it's like to read that? Do you understand what it's like to read that? What are we talking about? Why am I so excited about that? Because this is where the disruption beam is. This is the subterranean level. This is the beam 
that goes down out of the vector from the monopole and has the disruption. This is where they are arguing this area here is where they went, having had all of their experience and their experiments and seeing these weird effects affected by solar uh, um, uh, flare cycles, not so solar flare cycles, sunspot cycles, from this alignment with uh, Betelgeuse and Regal in, in the constellation of Orion. In 1997, my friends, they went with all of this knowledge, with the certainty that the energy that was coming into the room was into the pyramid was coming in where where it was coming in here here there why why did they think it was coming in there for the same reason i believe well maybe not i don't know but i believe it's coming in there because that's what happens in experiments <laughs> that's what happens in experiments the room would amplify the effects of the generated signal and consequently control the bubble. Something down here would control the bubble. The experiment never happened since the Egyptian government had sealed off the area, only allowing access to busloads of tourists who had previously paid additional amounts of money to be locked inside for an hour or two to meditate. There was no longer any guard or custodian who would allow them to gain access. Since there was no method to use the Great Pyramid at that time, they decided to try on Kefren's Pyramid, uh, which is the next largest pyramid. The, pyramid. the equipment was set up at the southwest edge and the energy field was turned on and off to the value of pi equals 3.1415, a universal constant, which is the ratio of a circle circumference to its diameter, for those that didn't know. This value was pulsed down the conduit, possibly to Orion. Did anyone hear them? The experiment ran for several hours, and unfortunately, when they came back, all the equipment was stolen, and nobody knows if they succeeded. An interesting question to ask is, did the ancient Egyptians know if this conduit, uh, of this conduit and use it in some manner? I argue it's a matter of extracting the flux of relic neutrinos that are available at that time. That's my view. Uh, there is much speculation here, especially when uh, we read the Pyramid Text, which is the oldest known religious writing in the world. They talk about the pharaohs traveling towards Orion. We assumed this was part of the death myth, but maybe there is more to this. There will be further discussions of this later in the book. Joe has been trying to experimentally measure the, and control this energy field or bubble for 20 years. He has discovered that once you have successfully conducted a hyperspace experiment, you significantly alter all areas above and below the plane of the experiment. After many years, the outcome has produced a stationary bubble attached to ground zero with a root structure inside the Earth extending 56 feet in all directions. Above the Earth, the bubble, like a giant mushroom, like a giant mushroom. Oh, where have I seen something that looks a itty bitty bit like a mushroom? Uh, could it be Tezza's 1914 Wardenclyffe Tower patent? Has fully en enveloped his house. During any 24-hour period, the bubble expands and contracts by tidal forces. Maximum gravity translates to the smallest size bubble. At this time, when practical, a, when practical, a pressure difference from inside to outside can be measured. When fully expanded, a scintillation counter can measure the cosmic ray background attenuation. You cannot measure the bubble's outer boundary as you approach it and enter inside, but as you exit... The boundary falls back upon itself, causing a measurable vibration at the center. There is no way to destroy an established bubble, but it can be controlled by a high voltage spark discharge. But it can be controlled by a high voltage spark discharge. This is exactly what was claimed by, uh, Ale uh, by Alexander Shishkin when I was in... Uh, um, the conference in 2018 in Sochi in Russia he says that a torsion field 
cannot be affected by anything other than a high voltage spark discharge. The bubble has had its most serious effects on honeybees that wander within a 30 foot radius from the center. Besides scrambling their navigation system, which means one would imagine that it affects the geomagnetic field of the earth and potentially electrostatics, it appears to cause extreme distress to their metabolism, causing death within a few hours. This is a concern to me because a lot of antenna are using this principle. Just saying. Uh, Joe's goal is to try and understand the, th the physics of the bubble, since he feels this will answer many questions. I agree, Joe. I don't know if Joe's alive. It would be interesting if he was. I'd like to have a discussion with him. A very interesting observation which would be relevant to many people, is that Joe thinks that the bubble or energy field is not user-friendly at specific times. This would occur during a two-year period of the sun's 11-year cycle. During this time, Joe has evidence that it can extract energy from any source, either mechanical or biological extract energy from any source either mechanical or biological i will do the translation of dubovic talking about the fact of the risk of these types of experiments because it can literally suck life force out of you suck life force out of you it can suck energy out of anything this is what i was talking about with the shakparanov experiments with this projected structure, which I'm saying is what is occurring in the subterranean level, that can extract energy at a distance and in the Lockheed Martin methods for creating coherent matter wave, matter wave patterns, I am saying this is represented in there as one of the applications which is listed as single bath thermal extraction. Now, Shishkin, Dubovic, Kurals, et al. They are arguing that atoms are kept alive, their electrons are spun by a relationship between the cold neutrino flux, the what they call background, background neutrinos, that are pulled into the atom nucleus. They have a relationship with this magnetotoroelectrical shell, this, this cluster of relic neutrinos that are in the atom. They, the, if the atom is a little bit under-energized, it will extract some energy from that, and then it will spit out the slightly denuded relic neutrino energy uh, particles. If they are overexcited, the cluster of relic neutrinos will then sh expel some of that energy to the relic neutrino field. And in this way, matter keeps stable. Okay? Now... What they are saying is that you can use this fractal toroidal moment to extract energy from any atom. Suck it out. Single bath thermal extraction. You can make cold atoms. You can make hot atoms. You make cold atoms and hot atoms. You have an annihilation ray. You have a freeze ray. You have a weather control system. You have all of the gubbins above. That is what I believe he's saying here. Joe has evidence that it can extract energy from any source, either mechanical or biological. And I'm saying that you can use the inverse of this to put energy into, if you wanted to say, affect a stimulated uh, earthquake or something similar. Meditating inside a bubble at this time is not recommended. This could have implications for many people who use pyramids for meditation. It appears that preliminary evidence shows that extended exposure may cause interference with higher brain functions. The research regarding the effects of this energy field to high brain functions is preliminary. Joe has also come up with an interesting hypothesis which has not been tested yet. History or the length of time a pyramid sits on in one place is a prime function in all hyperspace operations. 
if a method can be ever devised ever be devised to close off the bubble in the great pyramid there is every reason to suspect that if you are inside it you could travel up and back along its history and solve once and for all when the pyramid was built again this is pure speculation but joe's predictions have a high track record for success i don't buy the back i can't see how the back would work but as i've argued many times that inside this bubble long before i discussed and made the connection to the pyramid inside this bubble because you are disconnected from the thing that in my view allows for conscious uh, interaction with the akashic record that allows for the passage of time and the action of gravity your local timeline is effectively frozen and therefore if you are in there the normal time can go on outside all the time the bubble is there and therefore you could per be perceived to have lived for hundreds of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years by going into the pyramid and coming out you know and i described that in another presentation fire it up boys i'll be out in 500 years right and you go in there and for the person in there it, it's like a, a split second uh, but when they come out it's kind of like uh, um you know 500 years have gone by and they can see what's happened right so they can appear to live for very long periods of time so i do not see i do not see how you can go back in time other than uh, if you kind of like um i don't know I, I don't want to go into it right now I, I i can easily see how you can go relatively forward in time uh where were we uh blah 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 uh, where did we get to Yeah, la la la. Mm. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Joe's results can have significant implications in terms of space travel, levitation, military defensive shields and maybe even time travel. Let us explore some of these possibilities. If the results of Joe Parr's experiments turn out to be correct, and physicist Dan Davidson has confirmed them independently, what kind of applications could we have? Obviously, if objects inside the energy field or bubble lose weight, maybe this could be applied to a moving large objects. Maybe the ancient Egyptians knew about this and utilized this energy field or bubble to build pyramids and massive structures. You think? Also, this may explain the building of other ancient monuments and large structures. The shielding property of the bubble could obviously have <coughs> military applications. Can you imagine a soldier or even an entire country having this kind of shield? Hmm, I wonder you suggested something like that. These are all possibilities. Remember when the transistor was invented, it was not until many years later that the app, its application and com, uh, its application in computers was utilized and revolutionized our world. Finally, if the pyramid wants to move down its energy conduit, maybe we have the potential for a new hyperdrive transport, space hyperdrive transport. I am sure if you use your imagination, you could come up with many more applications. But first, like Russian and Ukrainian pyramid research, more studies need to be done. Well, essentially, it shields all forms of radiation. Done. That is what I've experienced. That's what I think the data shows. It can uh, both go through matter if it's energized to a certain degree and disrupt it and tunnel through matter. If it's energized in a different way, it can teleport through material. If it uh, uh, is energized, it would argue that it basically has no gravity. I've argued that the skin can be punctured. And if you puncture the skin, the weight of the universe pushes on that puncture hole before it reseals and you get launched off in a vector. And because you have no inertia, uh, no inertia and you have no uh, uh, mass, you can change direction uh, uh, instantaneously without having the problem with inertial uh, changes and, and the mush that that would cause your body okay uh, 
obviously there's the energy implications uh if you and uh, i've argued the simplest thing would be to lift ten thousand tons of water to a reservoir at the top of the hill and let it run through a uh, um a uh, generator um I, there are risks and they talk about some of the risks that he has identified with the built-up field around his device uh, or his experiments at his ha house with bees so this needs to be addressed and, and thought about and he's also identified risks during the uh, sunspot cycle of the sun and so it would be in my view useful to know when there's a high natural flux of relic neutrinos that is what I believe is the thing that's causing this uh, but then likewise if you are producing those and they do the action because they allow for the weak force interactions that allow for both uh, beta decay and, and uh, electron capture uh, you can synthesize lighter and heavier elements uh, 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 respectively and if it's a very strong force then you can cause in my view the decay of nucleons as observed by Kladoff and verified by the people using the hydrowave technology later in 2007 and uh, verified by uh, into also in 2007 by Roy Shinomaza. So um, uh, this for me is very 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 fascinating. Uh, so let's see if there's I don't know whether I want to go on anymore because I haven't even skim read the rest. Um, uh, there's some more by the replicate person that did the replication here uh, by Dan Davidson, this physicist. Um, and so maybe when I realize, uh, look through that, it will have other revelations. I mean, for me, for me, just finding out that the time that we did our so-called auspicious date start for an experiment, and then we, which was California time, was uh, exactly uh, when was that? It was December. Um, there we go. December the thirteenth to the sixteenth. Our experiment was effectively started European time on December the 13th. And uh, I gave a presentation in Rome on December the 14th. And it was still running on, uh, I think, December the 16th, maybe. And so that, for me, is a bit of a, uh, a head um, foobar, as you might say. Um, but it's all entirely consistent, entirely consistent with this book and the data in it, as is his observations of sunspot cycles. Okay, so uh, with that said, I'm going to see if you've got any questions here. Um, but for me, this is, uh, it's been a little bit weird. Um, just, to, just to reiterate uh, where we started for those that missed it. Uh, there was a diagram posted uh, that was the first thing in. The, I've not read the rest of the book other than skim through it. So, like, th this is the bit that I got interested in because I saw an energy bubble, an energy field of bubble around a pyramid, and and I saw this structure here uh, with this 52 degrees, which looked familiar roughly, and the 26, which looked familiar roughly. So I thought, let's have a look at what this guy is saying and what he did, and so therefore uh, it took me down a uh, path and I recreated a much higher fidelity um, version of his uh, structure uh, which ended up looking like this there we go and uh, when I compared that with the imported and correctly scaled uh, pyramid great pyramid of Giza from Wikipedia converting the uh, scalable vector graphics through Adobe Illustrator to Adobe Illustrator three files and then into Lightwave here uh, it looked like this and I noticed that the center point here of the bubble was uh, in a place where it wasn't in any relation to the um, the descending the the ascending gallery uh, 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 sorry the ascending passage and and the grand gallery and and by the way it I think I'm right in saying that the Great Pyramid of Giza is unique in that it is the only pyramid with an ascending passage. 
okay everything else has a descending passage but the or straight passage or whatever but it's the only one that has an ascending passage so it is unique um and so uh, i concluded that to <clears throat> to get this lined up with this i had to scale from the top of the pyramid to keep the ratios and the slope angles and everything and the angles exactly equivalent and that gave me this version of it and it turns out that to maintain uh, that angle uh, the official angle uh, and it's touching the inside of the ascending passageway top and goes all the way in free space all the way up to the entrance way effectively uh, inside the entrance way of the passage that goes into the antechamber uh, it actually crosses at what I call the Cairo, the Chi Ro, the Cairo, uh, which is at the apex edge of the step uh, on, uh, which I call the Christ Center. And so when you start laying in the O structures there, the N minus one tour, if we put that in the foreground, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's just a thing of great beauty. And uh, we can put in the uh, lemon and the sphere and the apple and our end tour with our disruption zone so the other thing that was huge that came out of this that having done all of their research seen all of these effects which lined up with alexander parkamov's relic neutrino theory which in my view lines up with the etheric matter streams of nikola tesla they concluded that where the flux enters the pyramid is in the subterranean cha chamber. And I agree with that view. From a very different point of view, I agree it because I derived it from physical experimentation. The actual witness marks from multiple independent experiments. So son of overbook uh how did they illuminate the inside of the great pyramid possibly with very very little handheld pyramids uh with uh, some of the material in there i don't know uh thank thanks and uh, martin it, literally it's like i it, i'm at a point now where I'm, I'm reasonably confident that it almost doesn't matter what new when i say new this is not new this is research going back to the 1970s okay this is pre lena right <laughs> I, I i'm pretty confident that when i go there the data is all going to be pointing in the same direction because nature isn't going to give you a different answer <laughs> it's good it's going to give you this answer it's going to give you this answer whether you like it or not you can have an opinion <laughs> you can really 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 want it to do something different but you're going to have to find yourself your own private universe <laughs> So, uh, Corky Goss, uh, Christ is actually Tyro, and uh, uh, it's a correction of the ancient. And I'll come on to this with, with other archaeological artifacts uh, um, after mid April. Um, and, and I think it will be extremely clear why the Greeks uh, 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 remastered their work and, and why the coptic christians remastered their work with the insight probably from john the baptist or or, or the 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 person uh, uh given the name uh, jesus and you know um uh I, I i don't have any reason to not agree the fact that someone existed 
and and that uh, you know the things that the technology can do he could have done them and uh, um you know um you know of god so you know he gave a gift to the world um that is absolutely for certain okay so Spinning of the pyramid in the centrifuge would be analogous to upping the ambient torsion in the Giza pyramid. Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, essentially, the pyramid is spinning on on the Earth's daily spin, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's. I guess that's where their logic came from. Um, but when you are spinning, you are also passing the pyramid through a flux of relic neutrinos uh, uh, and they are arguing that the pyramid is capable of capturing these things and, and storing them and and so yeah, yeah i mean but i'm arguing that the the the, the whoever built the pyramid uh, knew a little bit more of the science and, and was actively producing the structures that we have seen do things in um uh, Lenner experiments that that do things in ultrasound experiments, and it's phenomenal to me that he identified that these these uh, structures, it, it, effectively the bubble is in my view a representation of a right the right level of intensity of clustering of the structures in uh, into this fractal toroidal structure, okay, and sound is able to do that and we see that sound is able to do that in the uh, effectively tibetan singing bowl experiments the derivative of effectively is the ultra experiment and so um yes sound can turn it on and off and in fact i i've shown you that the the yin yang structures are formed in fractions of a second small fractions of a second yes the frequency is 48 kilohertz uh, 40 Three kilohertz, sorry. And so there's lots of cycles per second. He's saying that in the case of a particular pyramid structure, there's this 51.5 degrees. And maybe we can learn from that. But I ha hypothesize that any frequency will do. Um, it's just creating iron acoustic waves. It's creating cymatics. It's creating shear forces. It's creating instability. And out of that instability and, and cymatics and shear forces you are getting the self-organized uh, structures that do the work and they are doing it with these relic neutrino uh, structures So Ken says he knows a place where the bees are disoriented, like you have read about. Need the uh, need the bubble and neutrino stream detectors. Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, this might we might have a solution to dealing with bees that are disturbed, and it might be, for instance, I mean, what Shishkin argues that any spinning high high frequent high rotation spinning uh, uh, matter will create torsion waves and you know these are not good for biology and the only way to get rid of them is to have a uh, uh, high intensity spark discharges so if there is a place where bees are having a problem it might be a good idea to uh, go and solve that problem and this might even be a, a whole business for someone where they just literally go and take a low uh, high powered tesla coil and go, look, I'm going to fix your bee problem. Right, now see how your bees do. And it might just be fixing um, uh, ambient torsion fields that might have been set up by some turbine generator many, many years before. It might have just been someone brought, like, you know, I don't know, they just had some, like, turbine going there, you know, you kind of you kind of think that maybe a wind turbine might be really bad for bees, 
just because you've got a spinning metal structure uh, and that is setting up a torsion field. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, you kind of have to reassess a lot of what you think is possible uh, it, when you are looking at things that you can't physically see and you don't know are necessarily interacting with the material. WP for truth, that's excellent. He says there's an underground pyramid and he's going to prove it. That's cool. Uh, I look forward to hearing back. So I'm uh, um, creating awareness. I don't know uh, whether you're talking to me, but I'm going to do the GEET analysis uh, of the anomalous effects probably next Sunday. Um, uh, like I said, it is I intended to do it this week, but I haven't got the 3D geometry and stuff prepared. I've done it all in my head, but uh, it's relatively simple to explain those anomalies in my view. Um, but when, when this turned up, uh, at 4 p.m. on Friday and I started reading it and I saw that picture it was like this is what I've got to be doing <laughs> and I literally couldn't have believed that whole December the 13th thing uh, that that just that's that has really spun my noodle today like a real matrix moment there <laughs> Yeah, DIY Project says uh, they had like like neon tubes, basically, and gas, low pressure gas tubes, and quite possibly. I I WP for Truth says that that Jesus Christ is the person that that gave him the information, and I I can't say n no. Uh, you know, I do my own praying in my own way. Uh, um, certainly, uh, much of my understanding is not something I've invented. It's, in, in fact, most of it is just it, it comes to me, and uh, that there we go. But um, a, a lot of it is just <laughs> very hard work over many years, <laughs> and uh, uh, ignoring people saying, "Oh, this is just seeing seeing faces in clouds." And it's like, well, there's a lot, a lot of different clouds made of a lot of different materials by a lot of different people. And why is it all showing the same picture, <laughs> right? Um, follow the evidence wherever it leads. And, and you know, um, th there are those out there that will say, oh, pyramids are off limit. It's occ occult is off limit. Like hidden knowledge is off limit. This is off limit. That's off limit. How on earth can you reasonably assess uh, um, what you are possibly seeing in experiments if you exclude huge parts of human experience and understanding and, and intellectual output. It's, it's ignorance at the highest level. It's, it's um, hubris. It is, it is uh, arrogance to say that these people that drew these fantastic pieces of art that had these inspirational moments that created these wonderful structures that they somehow are irrelevant because we're so wonderful in this modern age that we know everything and you can't possibly learn from people scratching around on stone right sorry i think you'll find you can so uh Taren art saying a prototype when so Part of why I'm doing this work is, I mean, one thing you'll see is that in this diagram, the 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 bubble doesn't uh, extend out to the uh, uh, this uh, corridor that comes in. Now it says this this was done in 2015. I don't believe it is because I don't think there was any corridor. There certainly wasn't a corridor in the previous diagram I got off Wikipedia. And it says the week, the corridor is currently nine meters, what you can observe. And I don't know. Um, uh, it, it, this is actually eight meters. I've measured it. But it's nine meters if you if you include the chevrons. Now, it doesn't meet the outside of the bubble in, in this diagram. The, the, it's still very close uh, to the sealed off area here. So that's fine. 
But if this energy field can extend out to this point, then it might be that it, it, if, if my logic still holds, that it's only when the energy field is not detectable uh, or not visible interacting with ordinary matter inside this tube that it's essentially safe to go into the reactor, as it were. There's that, and, and I, you know, whoever built this really, 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 really understood the science. But it isn't actually that complicated. It's not actually that complicated. But they really, really understood it before they built this. So uh, I, I, what I think is, uh, I, my wife has a friend in uh, Vietnam who works at this quarry where we have, they, they've literally got mountains of this incredibly high quality marble uh, um, which is calcium carbonate. It's the stuff that I fully characterized for the HHO uh, experiments it, it, as part of the attempt to offer a solution to Nine Sigma uh, for fixing the Fukushima tritiated wastewater. Uh, um, and now I understand why I was doing that because I needed to understand fully the importance of calcium carbonate because that allowed me to see exactly the importance of why this was constructed with what it was and because you only need to seal on the outside and the outside is not where the main action occurs should be relatively easy to construct this i would probably use uh the thoriated sand uh, that i have some of uh, in the active area here and um you know we could excite the thing with whatever frequencies is necessary in terms of sound um, and we can obviously align it to magnetic north or we can put it the whole thing in a solenoid so th there's lots of things to test this and, and and so you could build it in two halves or maybe a couple of halves so i just need to find out what the best approach is to uh precision mill out what i believe are the key chambers the the grand gallery the mirrored grand gallery and those kind of things <laughs> Terran Art, that's very kind of you. But, um, you know, it, it, it's it's slowly, slowly catch the monkey. Uh, uh, um, you you, you got a, you got a, a, a very, very great programmer told me once, you know, measure twice, cut once. Um, we've already learned in this presentation that there is a specific time of day which is absolutely in line with, with the research and specifically in line with the fact that Betelgeuse is in the constellation of Orion and he observed the flux change when it's pointing in that direction at that time of the year. So, you know, um, or rather pointing at, at Betelgeuse. So it, with his telescope, it, it is the same thing. And, uh, you know, being able to be sure that you are creating these dense clusters of the relic neutrino equivalents I believe is very important and so um, uh, yeah but I, I think that having the deep understanding of what is going on is is, is what's going to really knock it out <laughs> thanks Corky that's very kind of you it's, wow I've got like two different people doing <laughs> I, honestly I didn't expect tonight to go the way it was it was going to be a short presentation and uh uh, to to share uh, this work uh, by um, Joe Parr that dropped into my sphere of understanding on on Friday, and uh, to to have seen that particular thing with the alignment um, of Orion. Let's have a look for Orion because the other diagram is better. Wow, there's a lot of Orions in here, Orion. Orion, Orion, a lot of Orions there. Okay, so uh, nix, 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 A lot of Orion here. What are we going on about? Lots of Orion. Oh, it's got too many Orions there. It's, it's actually glitched out on me. Uh, It's got things about Atlantis in there. Like I say, I've not read this. So it would be interesting, actually, if people read this. What's this about? Uh, I don't know what I'm looking at here now. Um, yeah, anyway, it would be interesting if people read this book and, and, and see what they see relative to what we've talked about in the past. So in this guy's experiment, the guy that replicated it, he had this bubble around it. 
his structure. So he, interestingly, he had an overall bubble. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Large force fields surrounding the entire experimental setup. Small force fields surrounding triangles on the gravity wheel. What is that? That is a fractal structure, my friends. That is a fractal structure. Okay. <laughs> you want 10 functioning ones within a week. Oh, God. <laughs> these All these things will come to pass. I firmly believe that, uh, Terran Art. But uh, it's going to take... It's going to take a little bit more than willing it. Um, understanding it is something. So so what we've got here is uh, uh, small force fields around the little pyramids and large one around the overall structure. And that is, in my view, you have the large run that occurs around this structure. And because it is self-similar, the N minus 1 tors, okay, if we go here, and we look at those, the N minus 1 tors, they will have a bubble around them. Okay? I've, I've actually got the the directions going wrong on. Uh, is it the wrong? Mm, yeah, it's kind of wrong. No, uh, not really, but anyway. Is it wrong? Yeah, it should, the, the, the disruption beam should be going in the other direction. Sorry, but ignore that. <laughs> ignore that aspect of how wrong this is. What I'm saying is that there will be a bubble around these and uh, that is what you have there. And I think he says that he has in his diagram. Yes, yes. Look at this. OK, so he has copper triangles. Copper triangles and they are spinning around and each of those triangles have a bubble field around them. A little bubble, a bubbles and then big bubble. Well, there we go. How fascinating. And here is this uh, energy conduits discovered with gravity wheel experiment. Okay, so what they are saying is, okay, so here we go. Oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. So December the 12th to the 16th, Earth's maximum velocity is on December the 18th. So not only have you got the gravitational lensing of relic neutrinos, you also have the maximum velocity of Earth in the year, which means that the static relic neutrinos that are in the cosmos that the Earth is coming into, it has a relative higher flux over the year. I've actually argued, and I think it's on record many times, Wow, guys, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of donations there. Thank you, Bibbo and Alex de Castillo. Um, I've argued that the best time to do Lenner experiments is in late December through to early January. And the hilarious thing is, that is when uh, Alexander Parkhamov likes to do his experiments. And in fact, his experiment, his 225-day reactor was across this period. And I've argued that that is because of the relic neutrino flux. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to celebrate the first uh, super chat from Alex De, De, Del Castillo and from the BIPO5. That's just fantastic. Thanks, guys. That's really wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to go and read your questions. Um, okay. I don't know what I did then. I clicked on someone and, and it gave me some options and I just accidentally clicked it. Uh, I have looked into 3D printing, but whatever you're 3D printing in, it needs to be calcium carbonate. I, I think it's best to start with the natural material as they did at Giza and mill that, precision mill that. Okay, so... Um, Geopolar may be the key uh, WP for truth, but I, I think at this stage uh, we can just find a way of m milling um, the, the, the limestone that we have. I think I've actually got some in here. Um, yeah. I think, I think I've got a block here. But I, I can get this in any kind of quantity. Um, 
and it's really really nice stuff so look at look at this this beautiful stuff here look that is fine, fine limestone. And we've elemented, the, the, the only reason this is dark here is because uh, uh, it, it's just got a little bit of dirt on it. This stuff is beautiful, beautiful white limestone. And it's really rather pure, okay? So uh, the actual block that this came from was given to my wife's friend uh, as a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter block and it was a perfect cube. So, um, you know, I, I would probably ask for maybe, I don't know, something like 33 by 33 by 33 inches uh, and try and build something from that. Or maybe try some sub thing of that. But you can see I, I drilled with a normal drill a, a hole here and it's very, very, very clean very very clean in fact i drilled an even smaller hole here look you can see all the way through the block there see all the way through the block okay very 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 machinable to a high level of precision so that that's my what i would propose to do uh, um like that and then i would build the slot for putting in the thing uh, for the radioactive material. And I would start with that Kerala sound. I, I would like to try and build it all with totally naturally available materials. Uh, David, the, the cement that I would bind the two parts together with, fir firstly, you can see the surface of that uh, um, calcium carbonate is incredibly flat and it is incredibly flat. So we can have mating surfaces that are very highly sealed, but I don't think that's that important, actually. All it's important is that it needs to be hydrogen uh, 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 safe, and so it would need to, to be bonded together in such a way that the area outside of the uh, disruption zone so if we go back to this uh, sorry the the main disruption zone so this area here uh, for our purposes that 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 area where any spin material is effective we would bond outside of this area no no spin material gets affected really um and so uh we would bond around this area here you know uh, and around this area here the area that's a little bit more complicated is down here so i would probably have the pyramid structure bigger so that it, it extends below uh the the subterranean level just effectively as the pyramid is i mean the the pyramid's on bedrock so <laughs> it goes down as far as it needs to <laughs> in virtual sense yeah Yeah, if, if people want to apply to be a moderator um, for future experiments, uh, future presentations, then uh, uh, reach out to me. I'm going to, I think that's probably good because there's some brilliant people out there, you guys, and, and uh, sharing some links would be good. Um, Yeah, I believe the same thing's probably going on in the human I, I, I think I'm at moving towards the orientation of the body when they're sleeping to be north-south. And, um, you know, depending where you are on the, on the earth, there will be different levels of intensity in different times of year. By, by the way, uh, um, over the winter is when I get most of my insights, by the way. 
the summer's pretty useless for me. That's why I like to do, you know, visits to people from their spring onwards, late spring onwards. I've got the link to this book in my remote view for this presentation. So you can go and just literally click on that and it allows you to download it. Yeah, D David, so he just says he just joined. This has been a mind blower for me. I got this document on four o'clock on Friday. I, I skimmed through it. I found this diagram. I thought that looks familiar. I did some work. I produced this uh, uh, correlation diagram. Uh, and then I read what the guy said it did, and it is entirely in line with Space Earth Human, the findings of Alexander Parkhamov, entirely aligned with Bogdanovich, entirely in line with, with what we have observed. And that for me, one of the most crazy things was our experiment from 2012. Uh, literally, I was presenting it with its 12.5% uh, excess heat in the military base in Rome, on December the 14th, 2012, spack, in, uh, slap bang in the middle of this best time for this process to be occurring. And then the second big reveal was after doing their research for a decade or two decades or whatever, they decided to try and stimulate the process and, and observe the process and control the process by coming into the subterranean uh, 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 chamber where they believed the uh, energy flux entered the pyramid structure and that for me is mind-blowing secondly for, thirdly they said that uh, the boundary as we have observed becomes in, impenetrable when it's excited this is exactly my argument uh, uh, for why this would occur and why why the pyramid would operate in the way it would and why you have this blocked off area here and why you have to have this channel up here in order for the gases because nothing can get in or out when this is excited to a certain level and uh, uh, then they observed uh, weightlessness inside of the pyramid when this is energized they observed uh, no radiation getting in or out and they observed uh, a, a um, no electromagnetic and no photonic and other type of radiation getting in or out so it is a shield uh, per se so um, uh, every everything that they observed in experiments that apparently has been replicated by a third party is all of the things that only the things that can be that can explain what I've observed in Lenner experiments for the last 10 years. Thank you again, Taran Art, for your donations. Very appreciated. And you've got some granite, great. So, Corky, this is the easiest thing in the world for me. It's harder for people that just wanted straight science. Sorry, this is straight science. It's straight science. <laughs> um, but for some people that, that want shi shiny big apparatus that cost a lot of material, money and, and, and grants and stuff, the idea that you could create something very interesting out of natural materials uh, and geometry um, probably isn't something that floats their boat too much and they just don't want to know. They, I mean, I don't know how many people I've said, like, just go and get an ultrasonic cleaner, some aluminium, some water and, and give yourself 20 minutes and you're going to see the same thing. And it's like, what do you have to do? <laughs> they don't, they don't want to know. They, they don't want to know that this is how it works. They just literally do not, not want to know. Well, I know that there are some people that are really seriously looking into this or very, very serious players, but they'll try and invent a new name for it and claim and patent and then lock it up. But sorry, mate, <laughs> this is nature. You can't do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I found a lot of this. Corky says, I found mine in art. And I think this is in art. It is in art. Yes, WP for Truth, this is real science. It just is so, so difficult for certain people to, to you know, not certain people, just for many. I mean, 
if I was looking at myself now, 10 years ago, I thought, that guy's absolutely bonkers. But you make a diagram, you find out that the pyramid has to have been designed on this basis, and then you find out that a pyramid researcher that was researching when you were a little baby <laughs> took that research and concluded, having observed the phenomena that can only be explaining the Lenner experiments that you have researched, they observed it in spinning a pyramid around an axis. Okay. And and it lines up with the, all of the relic neutrinos. It's just, it's just, it's just, what a journey. What an absolute honor. Honor to be a part of this. Honor to share this. Thank you to everyone involved across all time and space. So questions about top, the, so they argue that there is something coming out the top and coming out of the bottom. And I agree. I agree. I, I agree that the toroidal moment is coming out of the top and, and the disruption beam is going down the bottom. The same disruption beam that I believe uh, was observed uh, uh, um, by John Hutchison in many instances um, and uh, by Pod Kletnoff where Pod Kletnoff took a superconducting disc and span it. <laughs> Why would it not produce the same effect? <laughs> Why? Why would it not? <laughs> Great, Alex Del Castillo. I look forward to seeing what you see. Can the rising beam do work? I think that the rising beam is interacting with this dark matter flux. That's my view. Because the toroidal moment goes out in that direction, I believe that it pulls the dark matter for flux back on itself. Um, I kind of suspect that if the vortex has one rotational moment, uh, it is pulling in uh, anti-relic neutrinos. And if it's uh, the other rotational moment... It, it is pulling in uh, relic neutrinos and therefore one assists in beta decay uh, and the other one assists in uh, 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 um, electron capture. Not necessarily respectively because I didn't fully think that through when I said it. Um, but anyway, uh, it would account for what we observe in terms of, you know, um, the, uh, how should we put this? Uh, the heavier elements being made on one side and lighter on the other. Great, as Alex Diskit del Castillo. I I see that experiment as a, uh, kind of like this. This is what the Tibetans were doing with their singing bowls thousands of years ago, right? <laughs> now you can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I I would recommend getting a big Tibetan singing bowl and start off the experiment by by showing them or even just the video that I have on my presentation from last year you know that that would be fine just do the video and then just say look this is what you can do it's thousands of years old now let's see what we can do in the the uh, uh, you know practical experiment Uh, I don't think the glue needs to be the same material. Sorry, uh, Edward. Um, I, what I'm saying is I do believe that it would be better if the glue is predominantly non-spin nuclei. And since a lot of glue tends to have carbon and hydrogen in it, that's difficult. But uh, you, uh, even silicone-based glues, it's got hydrogen, isn't it? It's silicon, hydrogen. Is that right? Uh, anyway, the, the point is I believe that if you bond outside of this the, vis the the actual sac main sacred geometry, so the, the two disks that intersect uh, with the visa capices. If you bond outside this area, and I believe that's why the pyramid is like this, because I, I've argued that the casing stones provided the, uh, and the reason they needed to have no gap between them is because they provided the hydrogen seal, okay? Um, then, you know, there we go. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I actually want to get a a big 
actually. I, I know that I, I looked at this and they were very expensive. I looked, so Corky's saying he's got his son got him a singing bowl. I actually wanted uh, to get myself a, a, an ancient singing bowl, but they're, they're like five, six, seven thousand dollars. And it's like, there's no way I can justify that at all, ever. Um, and even like good reproduction ones are expensive. So, um, uh, but I do want to get one for the house at some point. Yeah, I think you can use a slip like you do. Uh, I, th I think it, it's whether the slip can, uh, if you still have water in there. But uh, like I say, anything outside of this zone, I, I think it's okay. A anything outside of this zone. So you could almost like what you've used to mill out of here, you could end up with an incredibly fine nano powder. Let's work, work it down to a very small fine powder make a slip and then if the faces of the structure are very very tight then you could literally wet wet a, the slip around the edge you wouldn't want much because you wouldn't want the water to come in well i mean even if the water came in it wouldn't really matter it just become part of the structure the the, the activity rather Okay, so uh, this was um, this was O'Day centered, uh, and we discussed the work of one uh, Joe Parr and the bubble that can surround. Uh, spinning material, uh, particularly pyramids and triangles. And uh, this led me down a weird path of realizing that someone inspired by a what sounds like a fractal toroidal communication system was inspired by that and uh, how it worked with the cosmos to investigate the pyramid. And after a period of time, clearly has observed the effects that I believe have to have occurred in Lenner experiments. And uh, that during the time of our most successful experiment, it turned out during the course of making this, uh, giving this presentation, was the time when we had observed our first successful experiment and that their conclusion of their research uh, at a period of time was that the flux of whatever it is that comes into the pyramid structure comes in through the subterranean chamber and that the center of the sphere the bubble that is created around it it would appear from my analysis actually is at the Christ center exactly as uh, turned out from my analysis from uh, all of the other work that we have done over the last several years and so uh, this is another one of those moments where you just look back in time and this isn't research into, you know, this isn't research into yodeling or cheese making. This is research into the pyramid uh, and the conclusions are the same conclusions that I came to from the different angle of Lena research. And, uh, and there we go. It is the angels. The angels.
Um, a cone doesn't have these reflective... Well, so, f f firstly, Shishkin used cones of various material and was able to produce fluxes of uh, magnetotor electrical radiation. So, cones can do it. However, uh, cones don't have the same kind of sound uh, um, sort of uh, focusing uh, properties as a pyramid does. Uh, you don't get so much phase conjugation of sound. And uh, because, you know, you don't have kind of parallel it's not parallel but you know anyway th there's not that kind of effect um and and also like the geometry's relationship with the magnetic field is is different because you know it, even non-spin matter has electrons and they 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 are spin matter and, and the quarks are spin and so I, I i believe it's important to have the shape of the pyramid actually um i think that is and so like it's like it, that i always get these questions where it gives me the impression that someone thinks that they can do it better and i'm not saying that's what you're suggesting but i am saying that the great pyramid is perfect <laughs> it's perfect in the choice of materials the location the orientation the 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 internal schematics it is perfect uh, and i i don't know whether it is done as a as a gift to earth and like just just try and work it out all right um or or what but but it's perfect and let's try and get an analog of that functioning before you start saying well let's try and change perfection Okay, so it's uh, probably time for me to knock off. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you especially to all the uh, uh, chat. That's really amazing. That's that's the most chat uh, I think we've ever got <laughs> in one session. So thank you to Alex Del, Del, Del Castillo, the Bipo 5, Corky, and Terran Art for his many contributions. Thank you very, very much. It's, it's really, you know... Uh, uh, but likewise, thank you for the engagement. It's been wonderful these last couple of uh, weeks and months. Uh, in fact, these last five years has been a, it's all been a joy. Um, and and so, uh, you know, again, I, I I was too tired and I didn't know whether I was going to be able to do anything today. But I'd been working on this since Friday, and I thought, no, no, I I've been given this. I am required. It is my duty to get it out the door. And for me, the reward totally, the, the reward totally is to see that their experiments showed this December the uh, uh, 13th to December the 16th is the critical time. And I could not believe that. I could not believe you, you saw my reaction. That was my real <laughs> shock at, at, at that being, you know, you know, something told me we had to start that the experiment on that day. Uh, and I, I called it the auspicious time and it won't happen for another thousand years. And so, uh, you know, so it has to it has to be happen at that time. Uh, it's the center of everything. You know, it's 12th to 12th to 12th, 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 12th. Um, yeah, no, it's just, yeah. So thank you very much, Dobro Nots, uh, Buenas Noches. Please comment in the YouTube stream or remoteview.icu. There's only one reference for this. Again, as ever, I will share. If you go back to the previous streams from the last couple of weeks, I've been updating with references and GIF animations and, and other contexts and stuff. So please revisit those blogs because I, and you know, there's more, 
much more work to do uh, and, and I will fill those out as much as possible. I intend, unless something happens in between, to uh, explain the anomalies from the Geet reactor which are completely in line with this structure and this understanding and relatively trivial to explain. Some of you probably will have already guessed how certain things have occurred. Um, but there we go. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I will see you next week. And maybe if if things get a little bit too exciting and I have to share them, um, I might throw out some other presentations during the week. So thank you. Buenas noches. Dobranot. Good night.